we are now recording. OK, so this is uh, probabilistic programming four. Um, we will be discussing latent variable models and dynamic models using um, uh, our probabilistic programming software, the Forney Lab. Um, I will also, so we will first talk about probabilistic programming four. Uh, it's not an easy one. It's, it, I mean, they're, they're quite advanced models and, and um, I think it's also a, a nice moment to reflect and, and look at the, the code that's been developed so far. So in the first probabilistic programming session, you, we're just, we just did very basic conjugate models with um, very simple uh, prior likelihoods and posteriors. And, and now we've, we've, we've uh, fitted the variational Gaussian mixture model and the, um, uh, a Bayesian filter for a linear Gaussian dynamical system. So we've come a long way in just four sessions and uh, Yes, I mean, probability programming is a sort of an, it's more the, we're taking these uh, theory lectures from BERT uh, and, and we're applying them directly. So it's uh, it's all due to the, the progress you're making in the theory lectures that we're able to do this. Um, yeah, so after the, the probability programming four session, we'll, we'll um, discuss the assignment. Um, so over the past week, I've been getting uh, quite a lot of um, messages. So, I mean, there have been a lot of uh, uh, Piazza posts and I, I'm very happy to see so many of you helping each other out. And um, um, like if, if someone found a solution, it's almost immediately posted and, and that's great to see. Um, I am getting a lot of private messages as well. So uh, on Piazza, but also through email, through Teams, through other uh, communication channels. and. I think I'm, so the deadline's uh, Wednesday, and I think I'm going to um, publicly discuss some of the solutions to the questions that are that I see come by often. So the, there's basically four uh, errors, four issues that come by a lot, and I will, um, I mean, I've, I've responded to, to everyone uh, individually, and I will also do that publicly now. And um, yeah, so while I do that, also uh, you're free to ask questions about the assignment and uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm guessing today will be a long session with, with both uh, both parts. Um, yeah, so having said that, I will start sharing my screen. Yeah, can everyone see it? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. So um, um, uh, I so my voice is uh, is not that strong today. So I, I might um, trail off, or I might not speak as much as I normally do. Um, if you can't hear me, or if if something's unclear because I'm not pronouncing it correctly, please let me know, and then I'll um, I'll, I'll do my best to fix that. So uh, again, like like we've been doing so far, I'll just talk about the the, the notebook a bit. I'll just give a, a brief summary, a couple of minutes that gives you the chance to line up your questions, uh, and and we can then go through them individually. Um, again, please don't hesitate to ask questions. Uh, like I mentioned, these are quite advanced models, and so there's a lot happening in terms of code in 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 in. Uh, uh, under the hood, basically, in, in this uh, probabilistic inference engine. Um, so if there's anything at all that you are wondering, so why are we doing it like that? And why does it, yeah, or why does it turn out that way? Or why do you make this choice? Or, I mean, there's, there's a lot happening in this, uh, in this particular line. Could you, um, could you elaborate? Um, I'm, I'm more than willing uh, to do that. Um, maybe also a, a general tip, uh, you can, in Jupyter, you can go to view, toggle line numbers, and then you get, so within a cell, you can see line numbers. Um, and so, for instance, if you, if you see, if, if, I sh if I'm showing a cell on screen and you're trying to point out a line, just say, okay, well, in the current cell, line 15, and I know exactly where to look at. And um, so I, I, I see a lot of posts on Piazza where people don't have these line numbers in there. I, I mean, I never told you how to do that, so I, I perfectly understand, but they can be quite useful when referring to specific snippets of code. Um, yeah, so I'll just um, uh, stop the screen script. Yeah, I've got chat open. Um, I'm just going to go through the latent variable model uh, section first, just five minutes. Um, feel free to 
interrupt me uh, in through the microphone or in chat, we'll talk about it. And then uh, once we're done, we'll move on to dynamic models. And then once we're done, we'll move on to the assignment. Right, so in uh, Bert's lectures, he's uh, shown you um, um, the Cauchy mixture model as, as one of the prime latent variable models. It's, it's uh, definitely one of the most used uh, latent variable models. And he's, he's giving you the, this example of uh, old reliable or old faithful. This, um, this geyser that, that's in Yellowstone National Park and that, that erupts uh, and, and has this wonderful, um, so when they record uh, these eruptions, there's a wonderful bimodal distribution. It's basically two Gaussians. And uh, you can uh, yeah, you can fit a Gaussian mixture model to that to capture the, uh, the variance of, of the, those responses. Here I've, um, I've uh, tried to find uh, a similar setting it's a it's a non-engineering domain. It's about archaeology, um, and uh, so suppose um, you're digging in the dirt. You're trying to find something, and uh, you find uh, a lot of these sort of ceramic uh, objects, and they they um, they look flaked. To the, uh, uh, and for those that are unfamiliar, a flake is um, like a, a splinter off of a, a piece of ceramic. So I can. Uh, Probably Google that to give you an image of that. Not that it's particularly interesting, but uh, uh, this is never uh, really a good idea to do live Google image search. Okay, I'll, I'll, you know what? I'll skip it. Um, but it is, so a flake is a, has a particular shape, and depending on on uh, the tools that people use, so so either bone or or. Um, uh, metal at some point on, so you have the, the iron age, the bronze age, etc. And depending on the the materials that people use, the, these these flakes uh, they change shape over time. And so if you find a deposit of flakes, that means that um, that, that you're looking at um, a civilization from the iron age or the bronze age or something. So archaeologists use this kind of information to figure out um, from from what age a particular dig site is. And so what they often do is that they they manually inspect uh, a small number of such flakes and then make a decision. They report those uh, decisions. But so machine learning is is penetrating a lot of areas of of science and uh, technology, and it's it's also it has come to archaeology. And so uh, they can get a lot of students and then uh, measure all of these flakes, and they'll, they'll make a big data set, and then they'll try to use some machine learning tools to. Um, to gather some information from that large data set that, that is opening up uh, their field as well. They're, they're getting a lot of new insights. Um, so if you, um, so I'm here, I'm, I'm loading a, a data set, Stone Flakes. It's, uh, I've, I've linked the resource there, so you can have a look. It has a lot more descriptions as papers and references and everything. Um, but I'm gonna select two columns, uh, data one and data two. One of them is proportion of worked dorsal surface. That's a very complicated term, but that's basically, um, if you look at a flake, uh, the dorsal side is the, the back side, I think. And you can look where, how much of is that is worked. So how, much, how often has someone struck uh, a piece of tool against that flake? And if, it, if it's been heavily worked, then it's of, of a different age than when it's not been uh, worked. And here we have flaking angle. Yeah, it's, it's another property of these flakes, but this is essentially what your data set looks like, and we're trying to fit a latent variable model to do to describe clusters or concentrations of, of certain properties. And then you might draw some uh, conclusions about um, from what age it might have been. Um, yeah, so this is our data set. Um, if we're looking at uh, model specification, we, I mean, all of this math, you've seen that in uh, Bert's lectures, we've got a, a likelihood, so we have, um, uh, we have a Gaussian that's uh, centered at some mean and mu of k, and we have a, a precision parameter that describes the concentration around that mean. Uh, and here we we have a variable zi, which is a, an assignment variable. So you're going to assign one of these data points to one of the components in this mixture model. And so basically, whenever the assignment variable matches k, you raise this Gaussian component to the power one. If it doesn't match it, you raise it to the power zero. And any number raised to the power zero is one. 
So in this product over k components, you are taking the probability under one uh, Gaussian component, and then you do times one times one times one for all the other ones. So so in that sense, this assignment variable is a selection forms a selection of of, uh, of components. And so these prior these um, latent variables have a prior. Um, we have our likelihood, and then we have uh, the prior parameters of each component uh, as well. So, so that includes a mean, uh, a precision, and uh, uh, this is the prior parameter for the, the assignment variable. So that's a uh, yeah. So prior to observing any data, how likely is each component to occur? How probable is each component to occur? It's important to make that distinction. Um, yeah, so uh, our assignment variable is categorical, again, because we're selecting it. And if you can imagine, if um, once we've observed data, then this categorical uh, or a vector, so one hot encoded vector of zeros and ones, you can think of that as a distribution with 100% you know, certainty. There is probability one that this data point belongs to that component and probability zero that it belongs to the other components. And you can imagine when we're doing inference, when we don't know exactly to where uh, to uh, where to, to which component each data point belongs to, then we're uh, not we're not we're going to estimate whether um, that data point belongs to that component. So, but we will never actually reach probability zero or probability one. We'll have a number in between, so between uh, zero and one in the interval, uh, and th those will be the, um, the probabilities under the categorical distribution. Um, yes, yeah, so these are all the, the priors. So we have this, uh, this Gaussian prior, then we have a Wishart prior. Um, and for those who lost track of the lectures over time, a Wishart prior is, is essentially uh, very similar to a gamma distribution, except that a gamma distribution is a parametric distribution over a strictly positive random variable. And the Wishart distribution is the multivariate analog, but um, you can it, we don't have such a thing as a multivariate purely positive number the multivariate extension with that will be a positive definite matrix so matrix of numbers that are uh yeah that are positive definite so wish our distribution is a distribution of a positive definite matrices uh, and that's why it's very useful as a prior for the precision or, or covariance matrix um, let me just check no questions so far. Um, so in this uh, in this model, where so we have two features, we've already shown that uh, the flaking angle and this um, paused uh, feature. Uh, we're going to fit three components. So in this setup, um, in this particular model, we've got, we we need to fix the number of components. That's a parameter that we choose. So it's just the assumption I, for yeah. this particular problem, right? The number of components. Yes, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm free. I'm I'm the engineer. I'm the designer. I'm I'm setting this to a particular value, and that's not really a a Bayesian approach. So I do not know how many components I need or how many components originally generated the data. If I don't know something, then I should um, view it as a random variable, assign a prior distribution, and the and um, infer a posterior distribution. And that is actually possible. So the the model uh, that does that is called the Dirichlet process, or in some context, it's also called um, a Chinese restaurant process. If it's in a dynamic fashion, if you're dynamically creating and and uh, and destroying components. Um, but yeah, so the the extension of a Gaussian mixture model where the number of components is unknown and we put a prior on it and we try to infer a posterior is called a Dirichlet process. Uh, and so we have a very specific prior. It's called a stick breaking prior on on this um, on this uh, uh, on this. Uh, oh, that's actually the same page. Um, that's uh, that's the prior on the number of components, uh, and it has a very um, particular shape and it's a very advanced distribution and it's basically a model that's that we consider a bit too advanced for uh, for the course but the true Bayesian would not set this uh, variable num components to some value they would see it as a random variable and then uh, 
uh, infer the posterior for them. Any other questions? No, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. <coughs> um, so here we we have um, we're going to uh, specify the prior parameters. Um, so we have uh, three sets of uh, prior means, um, and it's important in a Gaussian mixture model to not um, center the components in exactly the same location. And we'll get to that uh, a bit later. So here, even though we don't know exactly um, where we should center them, it, it, it doesn't matter as long as they're somewhat away from each other. Uh, and then through our inference process, we're actually going to find um, uh, means that, that explain the data well. Um, we'll have some uh, prior scale matrices, some prior degrees of freedom, and some prior concentration parameters. And uh, so in the second probabilistic programming session, we already saw the Dirichlet Slade distribution and this notion of concentration parameters. Um, we talked about it a little bit there. If they are, all of them are the same value, then that means that the uh, Dirichlet distribution centers on the um, middle of that triangle. And if one of the values of these concentration parameters is much larger than the other ones, that means that the, the most of probability mass for that distribution lies in one of the corners of, the, of that triangle. And if we have more components, then this is not a triangle. It's, it's a simplex, but it's a simplex in higher dimensions. But the same behavior still holds. If all of these concentration parameters are the same, then it will lie. The probability mass will be somewhere in the middle of that simplex. And if the one of the concentration parameters is much larger, then it will tend to deviate to one of the angles of the simplex. Um, and and that's basically. Um, that's important because you're you're sort of biasing your model. You're telling your model that you think one of the components is much more important than the other ones. And so now, because we said all of them the same, which is sometimes also called a symmetric Dirichlet distribution, uh, we think that well, we're not really sure whether any of the components are more important than others. Um, we think we should be able to explain the data with three components. Where each of the components is is uh, equally. Uh, responsible for the data. Um, uh, we have, uh, yeah, so this is purely our, our uh, graph specification. Uh, so we have um, a factor of variables for the assignments because we have one assignment variable per data point because we, we, for each data point, we have to say something about to which component it is assigned. And we have a factor of variables for the, for the, the data itself, X, the, the the observations are stone flakes. And then we have a, a, a factor of variables for each of the precisions of the components and each of the means of the components. And we only have a single set of uh, mixture weights because we're reusing this uh, these Dirichlet parameters for the, each assignment. They are sort of a, they are a common prior for all of the assignment variables. Uh, so this particular block um, just specifies e the, the, each of the components. So we're, we're specifying a precision and a mean parameter. And then um, we're going to go through all of the samples and uh, specify. All right, so the current sample is generated by the Gaussian mixture, where we have uh, an assignment variable set I distributed according to a categorical with this common, uh, common uh, probability for, uh, for to which uh, component it is assigned. Uh, oh, I see. Sorry. Yeah. So I have to. I'll top every once in a while to uh, go back to chat. Um, and I see there's a few assignments in chat. So uh, Heng Jian has a question about probabilistic programming assignment. That's or is that a? Yeah, that's about the assignment. I'll get to that later. In the beginning of this live class, it was mentioned that we first discussed. Oh yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, sorry, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, all right. Um, maybe I should speed up. Maybe you guys have more questions about the assignment than the fourth probabilistic programming session. Is that um? Do you guys uh, want to talk more about the assignment than about the session or?
Right, so I'm not getting anything, so I'm just going to go ahead with the policy program four session. Okay, so um, so before in, in policy programming three, we still had, you know, if you look back at the regression model, still had quite a simple uh, message passing algorithm. There was a single unknown variable theta that we uh, wanted to know. We wanted to drive a posterior for, and, and yeah, so basically it just we we specify theta and then go through the this this steps to derive the the message passing algorithm. Then we went uh, into classification and already got slightly more um, more complicated because you had both theta and chi, this local variational parameter we needed for the, the logit uh, node, for this logit likelihood. And now uh, we've got a much more uh, extensive, much more, uh, much more complicated posterior factorization. But still, I mean, it should be very fairly readable. I uh, wrote it in a way that it just matches the components. So these are the uh, parameters of the first component, parameters of the second component, parameters of the third component, the unknown assignment variable, and then the uh, the uh, mixture weights, uh, fine. Uh, and still, oh yeah, so this is also where we, for the first time, are explicitly asking for free energy. We want the model to compute free energy. Um, and, and you do that here during the message passing algorithm uh, specification. <clears throat> Um, and what we would like to see later on is that so free energy is an objective function, and with this message passing, variational message passing, we are minimizing that objective function. So one thing we would like to see is that when we run a few iterations, that this uh, the value of this free energy functional uh, decreases for our current set of parameters. Um, yeah. So. Uh, um, can I ask a question about the previous yeah. uh, part? Yeah. Um, so here in the posterior factorization, now it's all written out, but is that the same as in probabilistic programming assignment three? Uh, not assignment, but uh, three there is just, um, yeah, like that. Is that the same or? Um, well, uh, so here we've we've um, we've defined chi to be a vector of variables, and then we, we index chi with i, and then uh, every element of this vector is given its own uh, random variable. Uh, and you can see that here as well. We say Z is an assignment variable and, and we have a vector of variables. So that's of length num samples. And so in the posterior factorization, we only say Z. So we're able to do this because we've specified Z as a vector of variables. And later on, we're indexing it and we're assigning each element as an individual categorical distribution. Um, we could we could do something similar here for uh, mu and lambda. So because we have defined them here as vector of variables, so we we could do phi mu lambda and z. Um, it's I'm not because, entirely sure. Yeah, yeah it's so. because of the categories, right? Uh, we just specify for the three categories for different mean and yeah. Precision. I think I I think I did it explicitly in this manner so that. Formula would generate um, these separate step functions for each component, and so you could, if you wanted to, you can inspect them. You can update the components individually. So you could also basically comment out, "I do not want to update the second component." And then, if you start to visualize this over each iteration, you'll see that, uh, for instance, the blue component would remain at its initialization, and you would see that the green and red components would try and take up more of the data points. I think I, oh, okay. I think I did this explicitly so that you can uh, play around with it a bit more. Oh, but okay. I, yeah, I made this last year, so I can't fully remember why. <laughs> yeah, understand. And is there but, also a reason why uh, it is called marginals now instead of posteriors? Yes. So um, in the earliest uh, probabilistic programming uh, um, notebook. Um, yeah, so so in the, in the first policy programming session, we we are very explicit about we have a prior and a likelihood and a posterior, and um, we're not using message passing at all yet. It's uh, it, it, I mean it's very clear in these simple beta Bernoulli models that that we're we're, we're updating our our knowledge of of uh, of some unknown parameter and we we get a posterior distribution. But later on, when these models become uh, bigger, they become uh, tons of variables, uh, and you can see that already in um, 
in 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 this part. I mean, this is a, a very short summary of of uh, of the the math that's in uh, the latent variable notebook. Um, this is hard to read. This is hard to parse. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of uh, math uh, notation, and, and it's sort of hard to see. Okay, which variables are actually set by me? So m0, l0, v0, n0, a0, they're all set by me. And what variables are random variables, and do I actually need to infer? So uh, in practice, you would you would uh, it, it's it's really hard to do all this math by hand. You're you're like you're very it's very probable that you're going to make mistakes, and so. Well, we have this. Uh, we transition to a factor graph re representation because it's easier to uh, keep track of. Maybe this is a better example. Where is that? Uh, yeah. So here we have a factor graph. It's easier to see what's going on. So these, whenever, whenever you have a placeholder or a clamp, that means that we've set one of the variables, and everywhere we have um, a an edge uh, with a variable on it and two connected nodes, that's an unknown random variable, and then we want would like to get a posterior for that. And if you're doing Bayesian inference in factor graphs, then you're 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 passing these messages, and one message will will correspond to the prior, and one message will correspond to the likelihood, and sort of the the prior times the likelihood will give you the posterior distribution. So when these two messages collide, they become the the posterior distribution. Um, but so so how do you represent that posterior distribution in the graph? Where do you do that? So. Um, we, we have this notion in a factor graph of uh, a marginal, and a marginal lives on an edge. So if this random variable theta is, is, uh, belongs to this edge, then we have a, uh, a posterior distribution that, that also lives on this edge. But whenever we, we um, have a posterior dis uh, um, so okay, so there's two things going on. Whenever we have a posterior distribution that's, that's um, that lives on an edge, we we have a specific reference to it. And within the factor graph terminology, we use marginals. The other reason for why it's called a marginal is because you could you could actually um, take all of the prior variables and take all of the, uh, let me go back to the, the math. So this is the full joint uh, model. We could take all of the prior distributions and the likelihood, multiply all of them, and we would get a, we would get a multivariate posterior. We would get a posterior distribution of the unknown assignment variable, of the, the, the mixture weights, of the means, of the precisions. Basically, uh, a posterior distribution of z, phi, mu, and uh, lambda at the same time, given x, given all of the data. Um, but that'll be some massive distribution. And what we, we, we actually want is uh, just the posterior distribution of Z and, or just the posterior distribution of mu or just the posterior distribution of lambda. And so what we would need to do is take that posterior distribution and marginalize out all of the other variables. So that gives us P of Z given X and P of uh, mu given X and P of uh, lambda given X. And um, so implicitly, that's also what's happening in this, um, in this uh, message passing framework. Yeah. Using, using its sum rule, right? For marginalization on the yes, posterior. If you, yes, if you're doing exact Bayesian inference, then you're using the, the sum rule. But, uh, 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 yeah. sorry, I, I couldn't get it. That there is no different code between the posterior and marginalization. It's the same uh, code structure, so. Well, so, so I was getting to that. So in a factor graph, when these nodes send messages, they are already applying the sum rule. So they, they have a, a prior distribution for X and a prior distribution here for variable one. And, and you would multiply that with the, the, the node function, which is in this case here, uh, well, it's this dot product, but uh, let's see if I have a better example. Let me go back to, uh, yeah, this one. So here I would have a, um, a prior node and I have a likelihood node. And so this likelihood node, um, or mm, actually I need, yeah. So, that's, yeah. so um, the nodes, uh, this equality node, for instance, it's getting two incoming messages from FB and FC. It has its own node function. In this case, it's just an equality function, but, but still it, is already applying the sum rule with respect to those two incoming messages. It's already taking the the prior, and then it's it's um, 
multiplying that with its node function, integrating out that, that uh, message and for the other one as well. And the result is then passed upward. So that means that so within a factor graph, when you're doing message passing, it's there already, every node is already doing some marginalization when it sends uh, a message forward. Because every message is always a distribution of, of one variable, namely the variable that's that's on the edge, that lives on the edge. So um, we want posteriors. This posterior for theta in this example, the probabilistic program three regression example, this posterior depends on a, a prior contribution, f of a here, and it depends on the likelihood that co comes from this node. But both of these nodes have already done some marginalization to be able to send a message downwards that's just uh, that's just a probability distribution of theta. That's no longer a probability distribution of y or any other variable or x. It's just a, a marginal distribution for theta. So we have a marginal message for theta coming from the likelihood node and a marginal message coming from the prior node. They collide, they become the marginal distribution for the posterior uh, for theta. And so... Yeah, that's clear. I, yeah, so I, I should have been a bit more uh, precise uh, with this. Uh, I think in all of the other probabilistic programming notebooks, I've called them all posteriors. Uh, but technically, when you're doing message passing on on, uh, on factor graphs, because there is this marginalization operation happening at every node, we are computing marginal distributions for each edge, for each random variable assigned to a particular edge. And uh, so. The, as practitioners, we've adopted this marginals um, terminology. Um, I see now that that might be confusing, this implicit switch from posteriors to marginals. I'll, uh, I'll take this feedback into account. Um, yeah, okay, so I've got a question by Dation. Could you please tell us more about how to use the Gaussian mixture? Um, yeah, so the Gaussian mixture node here is um, um, basically a custom composite node. It, it has so most of the nodes that you've seen so far in uh, Phonylab, and if you've had a look at some of the other probabilistic programming toolboxes, uh, it's very much the same. Most of these nodes uh, are known parametric uh, probability distributions. So you can go to uh, Wikipedia. Uh, find the Wishart distribution, and you see this PDF, and that's essentially what what this um, uh, this node corresponds to. The node function is this uh, this PDF uh, assigned there. Um, however, sometimes it can be very um, convenient to specify a custom composite node. We've already seen that in. Let me just clean up a bit. We've already seen that in the classification notebook. We had this logit node because I, I explained there that we had this um, a logit is short for a Bernoulli distribution with a sigmoid transfer function. So you have some input f of xi that comes in, it's being squashed to the zero one interval by the sigmoid function, and then it's being pushed into a Bernoulli distribution, and then we have a random variable out. So this logit node that you see here is already sort of the combination of the sigmoid transfer function and this Bernoulli distribution. And essentially the same thing is happening here in this Gaussian mixture node. We already have a set of uh, parameters for uh, a predefined number of uh, components. And uh, it takes in an assignment variable and says, okay, the current observation is assigned to uh, one of the components. So the, the if I, I mean, that's a high level description. A low level description would be a Gaussian mixture node is this entire function. So it takes in uh, uh, a data point xi, and then it computes this uh, product over k components, where each component uh, or the probability of this data point xi is evaluated under a Gaussian, and then that's raised to the power of the uh, of whether the assignment variable matches k or not. So yeah, so yeah, so the this is essentially the Gaussian mixture. Does that uh, make it clear? Yeah, I think so. So the first uh, parameter here is the, um, the order of it, and the second one is the 
the the the the rest the uh, mean and uh, the pre uh, the variance in the Gaussian distribution. Yeah, almost. The first parameter is not the number of components; uh, it's the assignment variable. But because the assignment variable is drawn from a categorical distribution, this zi is a vector, and you can basically just look at the length of that vector, and that's the number of components. Yeah. Okay. So you can derive that information from zi and indeed theta. Uh, so theta is here, um, theta is an empty list and we start defining all of these mu and lambdas and I, I push them into this list. So if you evaluate theta, it might be because I ran the notebook. Uh, oh yeah, okay. Um, So the second parameter of Gaussian mixture, uh, there's only um, two um, positions in the Gaussian mixture. That's why we have to push mu k and uh, um, that k into the into theta. Say it again, sorry. Um, because in the in the loops for k, uh, mm. we push mu and uh, how say it, uh, the lambda into yep. theta uh, and uh, we put theta into the Gaussian, Gaussian mixture. Uh, is that because uh, Gaussian mixture only um, can receive two parameter? Yeah, so um, again, if you, uh, if you look at this equation here, you don't see phi. So it's, it's really just those mu and lambdas for every Gaussian component. And then uh, this assignment variable. So, so does this xi belong to zi or not? But you, you don't see phi in here. You just have the the mu, the mean, and the precision mu and lambda here as parameters. But you do have k of them. So you have k means and k precisions for one for each component. Oh, um, uh, yeah. Maybe I I I, I say it in the wrong way. But because I thought in the Gaussian mixture, I can put it in the zi. And uh, mu mu um, mu k uh, mu or lambda. Yeah. So if you um, ah, it's because oh, the dimension thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So z i oh, has a z i is a, a factor of a certain length. So in this case, yeah. it's a factor of length three. So that determines the number okay. of components. Yeah, yeah. But so uh, if you look at theta, if you inspect it, yeah, I, I'm a bit disappointed. This is so uh, obtuse, but uh, it's it's a list, and this list contains mu1, lambda1, and then mu2, lambda2, and then mu3, lambda3. And this command here, theta dot dot dot, unpacks that list. If you worked with Python, you've, you've seen that before. You can define a list, and suppose you need all of those elements as input arguments to another function, then you could basically unpack that list. In Python, it's, uh, it's I think, star and then the list. And basically here, you can also define the Gaussian mixture model as um, mu1, lambda1, mu2, mu2, uh, mu3, lambda3. That's essentially what this uh, theta dot 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 is doing. But I mean, if you want to extend the model to uh, to more the components, I, I wrote the model specification in a way that you can, um, if you plug in a different value for num components here for, it automatically generates. Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah, so it unpacks the list and it automatically does mu four etc. Um, yeah. I mean, that's also a way in which it knows uh, the number of components. Any other questions? Uh, it can be a very weird question, but uh, do I have a chance to factorize the Gaussian mixture without mean? Just only <laughs> use precision. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you have to um, you have to fix the mean, um, but you can do that, I think. 
Um, so basically, I, I think that would be equivalent to um, basically doing like uh, one. Oh well, it's a two-dimensional factor, so maybe zero, zero, and then a lambda one. Um, but again, these need to be um, different means, so you can't you can't assign all of them the same mean. That's our assumption, right? No, so within a yeah, so that's one of the behaviors of a Gaussian mixture model. So you start your distribution somewhere, um, and they are slowly going to move. To, you can see this in Bert's uh, lecture as well. That you, they are slowly going to move in such a way that they cover the data as well as possible. That uh, all of them have the highest probability on the, one of the components. But if they all start in exactly the same location, then it means when you're trying to do these update rules, so which component should go where. And all of the components have the same update rule because they all all at the same place, so they all have the same responsibility for every data point, and therefore they're not ever going to differentiate. So in in this model, you need to start the component means as uh, as different uh, values. Thank you. Um. Yeah, so in general, this posterior factorization can be a bit hard to parse. I think this is one of the hardest components of this um, more advanced model because you, it's it's good to keep track of. So what are my random variables? Uh, I have a mu, a lambda, I have a z, a, a phi, xi. You need to specify all unknown variables in this posterior factorization, and um, the. The posterior factorization is also the rec the factorization of the recognition model. So you could um, you could say that some variables belong to each other. Now this won't work because the uh, Gaussian mixture model, the Gaussian mixture node doesn't like it. But in general, if you're doing perhaps you're doing some form of common filter later on, and and you've got both the state variable and some other auxiliary variable. Um, but you would like to not use a mean field uh, uh, approximation, but something that's structured, then you can uh, tell Fourney Lab such a thing through in, in, through this posterior factorization function. And you can basically just group variables together and say, I do not want a uh, marginal posterior for one of these variables. No, I want a joint posterior for all of these variables or a joint recognition factor for all of these variables. Um, and again, so the, the syntax for posterior factorization, put in all of the random variables uh, and then give all oh, and then give all of them a name. Because uh, when Tony Lab is generating this message passing algorithm, it's going to create one step function per unknown uh, per entry in this uh, posterior factorization function. And so these ideas, these names are it will name the step function in such a way and that's a uh, that's the thing you'll need to update that recognition factor. So here you can see that we have a step phi, step mu one, step lambda one, and uh, we have a step z as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't see any other uh, questions. Um, so, I mean, this is a very complex model, um, but some of the syntax, I mean, the, the the high level structure of the syntax is very much the same as, as it was in the earlier policy programming sessions. We define a graph, uh, we define uh, all of the random variables and all the variables that we know values for that are observed. And we, um, in this case, the extension is that we have a quite complicated posterior factorization, but we still uh, use this um, uh, compiler message passing algorithm out in the source code, parse source code. Uh, and then we, uh, we still create this uh, data set in the same way with the define uh, pre initialize our recognition distributions. And then we uh, start iterating over these. Um, these uh, fractional base uh, iterations. Uh, sorry, we start iterating over these recognition factor updates for for all of the unknown random variables. And so every iterate we can uh, push, we can compute the free energy. You can see, OK, what is the value of free energy after each update? And if you then plot that, you can see that the free energy is going down. So these 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 updates are um, are producing better parameters. The model fits better after every update. So this is a big cell, but this is quite a lot of this is just bookkeeping. Uh, in the end, we just want to plot 
the, um, the Gaussian components over our data set. And uh, you can see that they, they have different shapes. The blue one's spherical, the, and the green and, and red ones have, have uh, different variants in every direction. Or the one's horizontally more vari has more variance in horizontal direction, the other one has more variance in the vertical direction. Uh, so that's basically the Gaussian mixture model. Any questions on that? Oh, yeah, Stefan says, when you call posterior factorization, does Fornilab modify the factor graph? No, so um, it's, yeah, so it's going to get a bit, the answer to that is a bit um, technical in that if you use a mean field factorization, which means that I have a recognition model, I'm going to define a separate recognition factor for every um, unknown random variable. That means that there will be one recognition factor. Um, there will be one recognition factor for each variable, so we can assign one recognition factor to each edge. And that's then where the the marginal lives. And when we group variables together, uh, when we want sort of this joint posterior, and we have a or a joint recognition factor, then essentially Fornilab creates a, a difference. So these these marginals are no longer uh, directly connected to one edge because they're they're a group of two uh, variables, but Fornilab keeps track of in a separate data structure of all of these, uh, these these marginals. But it doesn't modify the the factor graph the factor graph itself. Does that answer your question? Or does, is that does that um, I can I. I, I will encourage you to play with Fornilab uh, yourself. Do some of the demos, and uh, I can uh, give you the um, documentation of Fornilab. Yeah, it's. Um, in general, a lot of people, even in, in sort of uh, current uh, state of the art research, use a lot of mean field recognition distribution because it's easy. It's also easy to interpret the results, um, but there are situations where structured factorization is preferable. Uh, when you add free energy is true, is it just for plotting? No, essentially what happens is that. Um, uh, so in, in one of the previous notebooks, I had this uh, command print line source code. Um, that's, uh, I think this is not going to work because I have two different model specifications. Uh, and I think I'm still on the graph one. Yeah, so I think it, it's not going to like this mysterious factorization, but um, yeah, it's got a key error. You know, let me... Um, Skip ahead a bit. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Yeah, so what I would like to show is that it's taking a while. Is that if you in so Fornilab has a no, sorry, I, I, uh, uh, Fornilab has this compiler under the hood, which um, <clears throat> This compiler uh, is inspecting the graph and it's uh, going to produce all of these message computations. So this node should output this message, this node should output this message. And then it wants to compute these marginals by um, the product of messages. And so when you when you call this message passing algorithm function, it's going to um, generate these step functions. And you can see there, they're quite big uh, step functions and everything. but um, if you don't ask for free energy, it's not going to generate um, a function to compute free energy. And you really need to ask the compiler, can you also 
give me a function with which I may uh, compute free energy. And the reason for that is because the compiler has to do quite a bit of work to compute that function for free energy. So if you're not interested in computing free energy, it's, you can, it's basically just not going to do that. And so the reason why it needs to, to do quite a bit of work to get this free energy function is because the, you can, so within this uh, factor graph, you basically have a distributed representation of the probabilistic model. And free energy is sort of a global property of the probabilistic model. You, you have all of the variables in, in one place. Uh, and, and that's that's what you need to compute free energy. And um, you can, you only, so, so if you have this factor graph, this distributed representation of the probabilistic model, you can compute free energy, but basically you have to go through each node and ask, okay, what is your contribution? So free energy can decompose that into a number of terms. So a node will have a, an energy uh, contribution. You can see that here, F, of, uh, F is average energy for Z1. And each edge has an entropy uh, contribution, right? So you can decompose free energy into energy and entropy. And um, so the compiler will visit every node and every ask and uh, every edge and ask, uh, what is your energy? What is your entropy? And so it will uh, basically start adding all of those, uh, those components together. And then when, when you want to call free energy, it's going to sum all of those contributions together and that will be your final free energy. Does that answer your question? I mean, uh, if, if your question is more about when would you look at free energy, uh, yes, a major reason to look at free energy is to, to plot it and see whether inference is, is, uh, is succeeding. Um, if you have defined a probabilistic model where um, there are pathologies, for instance, some priors that are not suitable uh, and, and your compiler still returns uh, message computations, uh, you, can, you can see that, or maybe if you're deriving messages yourself, then you've, you've put them into your own custom node, which is absolutely a thing with Formulab, and a lot of people do that. Um, then if you see the free energy going up, then you know that there's something wrong, either with model specification or with your message derivations because free energy is guaranteed to go down by purely by definition of the of the math. Um, so it's it's a sanity check, you know, a lot of times. Uh, and uh, sometimes we are doing free energy, uh, sorry, we're doing model comparison and free energy is also a metric by which we may select models. So uh, for instance, in this situation, you can, you can Look at that data. You can specify a Gaussian mixture model of two components, of three components, and of four components. You can compute the free energy, or the final free energy, after observing all of the data points for each model, and basically select uh, well the model with the lowest free energy has the best explanation of the data and the lowest uh, or the best balance between explaining the data and and the complexity of the model. Uh, and so the one you should pick the model with the lowest free energy then. Yeah, uh, Paula, you had a question? Uh, yeah, I had a question that relates to this free energy, but it's also a little bit about the assignment because, um, yeah, it, it, I just didn't get it to work at uh, question four. Well, I thought it did, and then I, I did multiple iterations, um, mm. and then I looked at the free energy, uh, yep. but then I saw that the free energy went down nicely, so I thought, okay, so it's, everything's good, but then I looked at my uh, mop, and it was, like yeah it was really weird it's it was not not okay at, uh, at all so could it be that okay. um the free energy is still good but your yeah the, everything else is just not yeah how could that happen basically uh, uh i don't know that sounds quite strange actually um, okay. uh, how could it happen I don't know. I, I would have to inspect your code and see the oh. so, so yeah. Send me a private message on the on the piazza or um, or an email or something, and I can have a look. Okay. I, yeah. I um I don't know at the top of my head why. I yeah I can't think of a reason why that would happen. Okay. Yep. Uh, Khan, you also have a, a question. Uh yep. Uh. So uh, I actually don't know what is the exact difference between preparing recognition distributions and model specifying in the code. 
Yeah, so uh, in the variational base lecture, I, I mean, I, I, I think it will be good to have a look at that lecture because that's a much more in-depth explanation. But um, to summarize or to be to give you a concise uh, explanation, we have a probabilistic model. That's the that's the generative model. That's the model we think generated the data. Uh, but that model might uh, might have some components that are uh, non-conjugate or or that in some other way give you intractable posteriors. And if you remember from earlier lectures, you so when you're applying Bayes' rule, you've got the, the product of the likelihood in the prior divided by the evidence. Um, and so if you have certain combinations of parametric distributions, such as a Bernoulli likelihood and a beta distribution, then um, we know we can analytically integrate um, that product that gives us the evidence term. And when we are able to obtain the evidence term, then we are able to analytically obtain a posterior distribution i.e. we get an exact Bayesian posterior. In models where we can't do this integration, we apply variational Bayes. Variational Bayes is an approximation of the posterior. And so we basically take a second probabilistic uh, uh, model, so a second set of parametric distributions. And we so we, we have parameters for those. So you can, for instance, so suppose we take a a weird prior, a weird likelihood, and we don't know how to compute the evidence, um, but we still want to obtain a posterior. And I can take a Gaussian distribution as an approximating distribution, and a Gaussian distribution as a mean and variance. And you can think of variational base as I'm going to adjust this mean and variance of my approximating Gaussian distribution such that that the KL divergence between my um, approximating Gaussian and my weird unknown posterior is as small as possible, is minimal. So I'm, I'm tweaking these these uh, these variational parameters of this approximating distribution such that it fits as well as possible. And so the second approximating distribution is called the recognition model. And then the recognition model might have many variables. So a recognition model, just like the probabilistic model, factors into separate terms. It might be a conditional distribution times a marginal distribution, but it, it, it consists of various factors. And so um, it, when you want to do variational base with Forney lab, you have to specify exactly, uh, I mean, model, the, the, the toolbox can figure out for itself, okay, these are your unknown variables. These are the distributions that you want posteriors for. Um, but the, the posterior factorization function um, basically tells you, okay, I want a recognition model where I want a separate Gaussian to approximate this random variable, and I want a second categorical distribution to approximate this variable, and I want a second de to approximate that variable. So posterior factorization allows you to specify uh, a factor for each unknown random variable. Okay, thank you. And if you're if you're using other toolboxes, so uh, this this Pyro for uh, for Python, that's a very uh, popular one as well. Maybe you'll you'll come across that after your uh, graduation. Um, it has a very similar thing. It's called a guide, and and basically it's the same thing. You you say I want one uh, recognition factor to approximate that unknown random variable, and one to approximate that one. And you need to do this in every probabilistic programming toolbox. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, I had one question. Hi, yeah. Yes, uh, this was related to variational base and uh, the question four that we have for the assignment. Yep. So I understood the concept of like variation base when we have a lot of latent variables and parameters. So especially in the fourth question uh, of the assignment, we are dealing with a case where we do not have any latent variables, but still we have uh, a few parameters that are not known and we need to assume a, a prior for them, which is, um, you know, some particular distribution. And then we do the recognition distribution, as you mentioned, mm. and then update the parameters iteratively until it converges yeah. and then yeah. Yeah, so uh, I I tried coding that as the uh, logic suggested, but the uh, I mean it didn't throw any error. But the problem was that uh, when uh, and as I think someone else mentioned, like Paolo or someone mentioned, 
um the free energy decreased and the map estimate was weird i didn't calculate the free energy but still when i plotted the map estimate of the theta parameter it did not it was like a kind of like a straight line which went which went on increasing it did not fit the data at all so uh, i just wanted to understand where i could be going wrong or is my intuition regarding variation base itself wrong for this application for question four um so if the free energy is going up um is it going up a lot yeah so that's the thing so uh, as i think I did something differently as compared to Paula. So for this part, I did not set the free energy equal to true. I just mm. calculated the, um, you know, I gave the positive factorization and then I went into the next step and created the recognition uh, distribution and then updated the, and, you know, just call the step functions iteratively. So mm. that's another thing I want to check. So if I don't give free energy as true, then what does it basically converge to? Like, what does it use to get to the convergence? It doesn't. It doesn't. So, oh, so okay. Fournier lab is. I mean, when you're doing message passing on a on a factor graph, it um, we we just have an algorithm to pass messages. That's the yeah, end yeah. procedure. But as long as each of the messages corresponds to a marginalization operation of the uh, node function with respect to all other variables that it's connected to. Then this message forward uh, is is uh, we ha we have an analytical guarantee that the, this message forward and this other message when they combine and when they perform a marginal update that leads to a um, equal or smaller free energy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so we we're not specifically interested in the value of the objective function itself. We are satisfied with the fact that this algorithm is guaranteed to minimize free energy um, for we. For, for every update, every iteration of the, the recognition factor update is going to produce a smaller free energy, and therefore we never inspect it. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. It's not like um, in some other, um, um, in, in that sense, it's a somewhat unusual optimization process because mm. normally you would see we have some objective function, we have an optimizer, you would walk towards an objective, and uh, depending on your learning rate or your step size, or it's, uh, maybe you have some other optimizer, then you might overshoot your objective. You can see that the value is going back up. You can say, okay, I don't want to go, I don't want to continue in this direction. And the algorithm might, or the optimizer might correct itself, go back. That's not, we we, we cannot go up through these uh, ignition factor updates. And because we cannot go up, we have basically have no need to inspect the free energy during inference. We might inspect free energy when we are deriving messages because we need to know whether our manual math, manual derivations make sense, mm -hmm. whether they have the same property as, uh, or, or whether they have the property that they're supposed to have, namely that they will always reduce free energy, uh, or when we're doing model comparison, then we want to compute free energy as well. But um, yeah, if you still have, if you have some issues with um, the Recognition factors for the fourth question. Um, yeah, also just send a message on the Piazza. Um, it's now 4.30, so I think I'm going to speed up a bit. Uh, I will very quickly go through the dynamic model uh, situation. Then I'll move on to the assignment, and I'll just go through some of the um, points, and we can talk about it again there. Um, so for the dynamic models uh, section, I've uh, chosen this setting for an Alpine railway. You can imagine there's a, uh, you're on a, on a car to train, it's going up a hill and um, your elevation, yeah, so it's a natural terrain, so your elevation might not go, uh, it might always be strict, it's not, it might not be monotonically increasing, it might always go up. Uh, and suppose someone from a distance is observing this cart and keeping track of the x, y positions. Well, if you observe from a distance, you have a noisy uh, observation. And so you have this linear Gaussian dynamic system that falls in this uh, direction with noisy observations. Uh, and so this dynamical model setting here is the basis for many signal processing systems that involve Bayesian inference. Um, so we have this uh, state transition, we have a linear state transition, some matrix uh, A, transition matrix A that we apply to a previous state, and then we add some uh, some noise, process noise Q, uh, that represents 
all of the factors that um, influence the uh, evolution of the process that we have not uh, taken into account with our deterministics uh, factor, namely this linear operation on the previous state. Um, that gives us a new state, and in this new state we, we have some observations, so we might have some masking, C, where we don't observe velocities, for instance, but just position. Or if you're on radar, in radar we can observe velocities, but not accelerations or, or positions. Um, uh, and then again, we have some uh, measurement noise on top of it. So that's the that's the um, noise uh, coming from the fact that we have a distant observer, and uh, you know is, this person's sight might be uh, blurred. Um, so the model is actually a lot simpler than the latent variable, the Gaussian mixture model. So we have some initial state prior, then we have a, a state transition and a likelihood. And almost all of it is known. We have some transition matrix A, some emission matrix C. We have a known uh, process noise covariance matrix and a known measurement noise covariance matrix, uh, which looks uh, fairly, um, I mean, it looks a bit, it's a bit bigger than the regression uh, factor graph, the recursive form of the regression, um, but it's still quite, um, quite small and quite doable. Uh, yeah, and this, so we, we are just interested in tracking the state of the cart and everything else is known. So we're just, we, we can do some product message passing here. We can do exact patient inference. And um, yeah, so the, the inference uh, algorithm itself is also quite, uh, uh, quite straightforward. And if you inspect the step function, if you look at the, or if you dive into Fourney Lab source code and you have a look at these, uh, initial factor updates, you will find an algebraic form that's equivalent to uh, the uh, equations you've seen from a common field. Uh, and that's also the result that we get. We get a, uh, we get a, so here you visualize the mean of this um, Gaussian posterior for each state. And uh, I think in the ribbon is the um, standard deviation of each, um, of each state marginal, so you can yeah you can plot that at some some point and then some uh, see through a ribbon around that that covers your uh, your mode of uncertainty, and so this is nicely tracking the uh, the observations. Oh, and that's uh, basically it. And here we've um, we've extracted. So this is also a bit more advanced than than what you would perhaps normally do. You can call. Uh, if you look at source code in this step function, you can see it, it, there's basically just five messages in this uh, this, uh, this uh, recursive factor graph specification. Uh, and then we you can see we can this marginal for xk, so the posterior for the state uh, is composed of message three times message five, and the message three depends on message two, message five depends on message four, message two depends on message one. You can see they're all. This is how they're all uh, connected to each other. And you can see there's two messages here, and then one of them is the prediction from the previous state. That's the prior. And then we have uh, an observation of the likelihood. That's a correction factor. And together they make up the, the state estimate. It's a weighted average of those two. And so even though uh, these dynamic models from a mathematical point of view might be a bit more uh, extensive than regression or classification, but actually if you look at the, um, the graph specification and the, the math underneath it, it's, uh, it's uh, actually quite a simple model. Um, beautiful, uh, elegant in its simplicity. And I think that's a nice note to end on, or at least to end the policy programming sessions on. Um, there's lots of extensions of these models, and you're automatically in sort of state-of-the-art signal processing research. Um, you can think of time-varying uh, transition matrices or, or uh, unknown uh, process noise uh, matrices. And whenever you have an unknown variable, you, you consider the random variable, but a prior one, and try to sum things and infer a posterior for it. And um, yeah, that's uh, that's the way the Embias lab designed Bayesian filters. Um, any questions on the dynamic model?
If not, then I'm going to move on to the assignment. Um, so basically, I've had um, four major uh, questions that I see pop up again and again. Um, so let me first of all, um, if you let me start with this one. So if you uh, inspect train data, so you can see here we, we have this uh, this file data airfoil train .csv, a comma separated uh, file um, that's put into a data frame. Um, uh, so if you then call it, this is what a data frame looks like in Julia. It's very much the same as pandas in uh, in uh, Python or just table in Matlab. Uh, you can see here, this is the, the first column that's frequency in Hertz, and these are integers. Then we have angle of attack in degrees. These are floats, court length in, in meters. Those are um, floats again, and then free stream velocity. So these are all, these four are quite complicated variables. Um, and then what you can see is that here we have uh, this frequency is 800, and we have 3, 0 0.3, and 71.3. You can see this repeating pattern on frequency. And so here again, I have, I have 630, 800, 1000, 1250. You can see there's a, di there's a different value for free stream velocity. And if you keep, keep on going downwards, because we have uh, 51 in this training data set, we have more in the, um, sorry, in the, oh, in the test data set. Uh, you can see that there are other values for chord length, free stream velocity, angle of attack. I'm basically ignoring all of these other features, and I'm just considering here, if we, if we inspect this problem just as frequency by sound, and these are just repeated measurements of the same uh, frequency level. Um, but it is, uh, when you want to plot something, if you are plotting with, um, test input or train imp, uh, input as a, sorry if you take train input as an input variable. Oh yeah, so here it's been uh, we've applied this log transformation to it. We can still see this repeating pattern in there. So there's three zero six zero two three zero uh, six zero two three six nine eight three six nine eight. You can still see this repeating pattern. So when you try to plot something, it's gonna try, it's gonna plot a line from here to here to here to, all the way through. Then it's gonna plot a line backwards again, and then here, here again, and it's gonna go backwards again and again and again. So you'll get a pretty messed up plot. So if that's why you need to sort the input, and if you sort it, then let's see, add an example of that here. Yeah, so sort per. Do that, then. Um, oh yeah, so this is going to give you the index, but if I then take train input, and sort it. I x. Uh, you're going to see these repeated entries. Uh, in this case, it's, there are three instances, three instances, four instances, and if you try to plot something now, it's just going to plot lines from uh, from each point onwards, and your plot will look okay essentially. I, I could have sorted the the data set in advance, but I uh, I think it's important to also give you this lesson that um, have a look at your data. So if, if a normal plot operation doesn't work, it gives you something odd. Have a look at your data. What are you plotting? Uh, you're plotting some input variable to an output variable, but if you see these sort of weird patterns, repeating structures in your input variable, you're going to get repeated structures in your plot. Um, and if you figure this out for yourself, that you needed this sort, uh, um, then um, kudos. Uh, OK, so I don't see any more questions. So I'm just going to go and uh, proceed. Uh, so a lot of you have, so I mentioned last uh, privacy programming session that the assignment is uh, like everything you need for the assignment can be found in PP3 and PP4 together, the union. And with that, I basically mean um, you've got a regression model in PP3. And in question four, five, and six, you need simultaneous estimation of two parameters and you need to compute free energy. And so PP4 has uh, this free energy part. We've just gone through it, just, you know, message passing out whether free energy is true. That gives you a free energy function with which you can compare these polynomial regression models. 
Um, and the yeah, so the other part is this posterior factorization. You need to uh, specify both a set of co coefficients for the polynomial regression model and this uh, unknown precision. You need to uh, uh, estimate them simultaneously. You want a recognition factor for each, so you want one factor for, the, for theta, one factor for your precision parameter, uh, and then you need to specify that in posterior factorization. Uh, so basically all of the information is in PP3 and PP4 to be able to do this assignment. But I've noticed on Piazza that quite a lot of people are directly copying from uh, the classification model in, pop in PP3. But please bear in mind that in the classification model in Plastic Programming 3, we have this logit node. And this logit node, even though it is this, um, it's just a simple combination of the sigma transfer function and Bernoulli distribution, it's still have, in order to be able to do variational inference on a logit node, you need a um, local variational parameter. This is described in uh, section 10.5 of the book, Bishop. It describes that this logit, this psi parameter uh, helps us approximate the shape of the logit uh, of the sigma transfer function within the Bernoulli distribution. So essentially, if, if you think back of a message passing operation, this local variational parameter is going to help us uh, compute the backwards message through this likelihood node. Um, but here, so a, a local variational parameter is very um, rare. It's basically only used in this logit node, and one or two extra uses, but it's, it's not something you're going to need for the assignment. And so here, specifically what I'm talking about is that we have defined this local variational parameter psi as a vector of variables. So you have one psi for every observation, um, but you don't need this in the assignment. You don't need a precision parameter for every observation. You can do that, but it requires a bit more work. And I've seen people um, struggle with um, getting the model to give you good results with a precision parameter for every data point. Any questions on that? Um, yeah, I have a question on this because you mentioned that you um, still need one local variational par parameter. You mentioned that on Piazza, I think, today. Um, but yeah, I don't really understand. I also do uh, um, one precision parameter distribution for all nodes, not so not uh, for each yeah, node. But... Let me be clear, you, you don't need uh, a local variational parameter per data point. It's fine to do to just specify at RV is uh, your precision parameter and then one distribution, and then plot that random, uh, put that random variable in the likelihood node that you're, you, you are going to specify one likelihood node per observation, but you can reuse the same precision parameter. Oh, oh, so you, that's what you meant. Oh, okay, so I only define it once outside of my loop, and then that yeah. should work, okay. Yeah, yeah. I, Sorry if that was unclear from my Piazza post. Oh, yeah, no, but it's clear now, that's fine. But then um, I do still have difficulties if I don't, um, yeah, if, if I do that and I have like a, a prior for that as well, mm. then I get, um, yeah, difficulties um, if I don't update it for each uh, iteration. So if I iterate multiple times over a step, then I get difficulties. Um, so you've, and the, and the algorithm runs, you, you're not getting any errors on. Um, yeah, I, on no, I don't get any errors, but then just the result is really weird. And what, uh, what distribution have you used to define your param, uh, precision parameter? Uh, a gamma distribution. Right, so you have a, a Gaussian likelihood and then a gamma precision parameter, and you, you share the, the gamma precision parameter for all likelihoods. Yeah. And you're getting unusual results after step updates. Um, yeah, and then, um, yeah, should I like update the values of A and B inside that iteration loop? Because it does, yeah, it just doesn't work. Um, okay, so that's that's one of the other situations. So. I mean, during the, the during PP3, during the regression model, we, we looked at this sort of batch 
inference versus recursive inference. If you're doing recursive inference, inference for the assignment, then indeed you would have to, you start with some initial A and B, uh, and then you make an observation, and then you need to, uh, then you're updating A and B, and then you need to um, push those posterior parameters, the new A and B, you need to push that into the model again as the, the new prior A and B. That's how you recursively go to the data set. You're updating your, your um, each the posterior at time uh, T is one becomes the prior for time T is two. So you need to keep track of those A and B as you go through the data set. If you're using a batch uh, model, you're doing batch estimation of the model, then you can define A and B once as the prior parameters, then absorb all of the data, and then you'll get a single posterior, uh, a, a single set of parameters for the posterior, single A and B. And those, uh, th then you don't need to keep track of it. Um, okay, so now I'm getting a few things. So Li Yuan says, I use the recursive method with fill to update A and B when step chi. Yeah, so when you do step chi, it's going to update the posterior distribution for the precision parameter. Then you need to extract the parameters from that posterior distribution. So if you're using a gamma, then you need to extract A and B. And you can do that by just posterior and then chi and then dot params. Uh, let me just type it posterior chi dot params do A and B. Uh, and this is basically only valid for um, or a common distribution. So uh, we don't have to uh, update uh, initial parameters for gamma distribution. Yeah, so if you're using a batch estimate, you don't need to update the initial parameters. You just specify them once, serve all of the data, compute one posterior. And you can extract the posterior A and B in the same way. You just do posterior dot params A, params B. And, and those are just your, your, your final posterior parameters. If you're using the recursive method, then yes, you need to, but if you're using the recursive method, then you will also have in your model specification, you will have a placeholder for, so you will say uh, your, your position parameter is a gamma and you have a placeholder A and a placeholder B. And then uh, when you feed in the data in, in the model, you'll have not just the, the current input and the current uh, output, but you also have uh, A and B. And so you need to plug in the um, posterior parameters from the previous time step as the new A and B in that data step. That's uh, if you go to PP3 recursive estimation, you can see that here. We have this this um, this theta parameter, which has a placeholder for mu and a placeholder for sigma. And then um, as we go through the data for IS1 to N, we are feeding in the ith input and the ith output, but we are also feeding in for mu and sigma the uh, mean of the previous posterior and the mean of the previous covariance. So this posterior hasn't been updated yet. So when you do mean and cov, it's going to um, yeah extract the parameters from the from the posterior as is. And here we are updating the posterior with these current uh, with these new observations. Uh, but it's not for a batch, so it's recursive method. Yeah, so this is the recursive method. This is recursive. Uh, if you're doing batch, it's you, you, let me just go back up. Yeah, so if you're doing a batch estimate, then you've got these prior weight parameters, mu and sigma. You define the weight prior once, and you, you define a model to use n copies of this likelihood node, and, and you might use this. Uh, yeah, so here I fixed this to some uh, some variance, but you, know, you, you can um, define your own random variable and then input it here. Uh, and so we only have one set of prior parameters. We define n copies of this likelihood node, and then when you're doing inference, um, you, only, you only define all of the inputs, all of the outputs, you do a single step operation and it gives you the final posterior parameters. You could just extract uh, the mean and the covariance from this one. Those are the final mean and covariance. Sorry. 
And when you're doing recursive estimation, you uh, you have to define these placeholders. You have to keep track of these parameters as you go through the data because the posterior time t is the prior for time t plus one. So as you go through the data recursively, you have to update these mu and, mu and sigmas with the previous posterior parameters. Is that clear? Uh, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, but to follow um, up on that, uh, yep. that's for then for the uh, tau variable and for the um, theta, I guess, because you need to both to constantly change. Yes. Yeah. yeah okay. If you if you're using a recursive model, you need uh, you need these placeholders for your coefficients and those placeholders for your precision uh, prior. Sorry. And and you need to so your your um, your uh, data dictionary has uh, both a mu uh, mu theta sigma theta and also an a of tau and b of tau if you've called it tau. Um, so G S Shang says where should we where should we add this to update the hyperparameters a and b in the data loading part of the iteration step update function? Yeah, so that's I mean I, I just explained. Batch estimation, recursive estimation. So both of them are templates, and I, I mean I can't reveal everything. It's it's an assignment. So you need to extract the parameters from the posterior and then input it through the data dictionary. If you're doing a recursive model, if you have a, a batch model, you just define the prior parameters once, observe all of the data, and then compute your posterior parameters once and extract the parameters once. In Stef uh, says, but for batch estimation with two params, we had to step multiple times due to bootstrapping, right? Yeah, so it's, uh, yes, that's true, but it's not bootstrapping, we, it's variational base. So we are iteratively improving these approximating distributions, this recognition model. So we, we, we have this posterior we don't know, and then we, so, so we define some initial posterior distribution, and then we're going to iterate iteratively update these recognition factors. So first one will be updated, will, will, will be a better explanation, will better capture the unknown posterior, and then the second one, and then the third one, and the fourth one, and the fifth one. So, so you iteratively improve your approximation of this unknown posterior. Uh, yeah, and yeah, so the, the difference here is that, so what I'm trying to show a bit in this assignment, and this is something that you'll come across if you're if you're going to apply probabilistic programming after your your graduation, is that currently a lot of people basically do this uh, in question one. They would have some uh, heuristic, some uh, guesstimate of this parameter, and it might be uh, I mean it might be somewhat principled here, for instance. If these really are repeated measurements of the frequency levels, then sure, I can I can look at the variance at each level and then average them, and that will be sort of a population average of the variation that you might expect uh, uh, in in the outputs. But you can already see the variance here is quite small. Here it's quite large. So this is something called the heteroscedastic model. It has different variance at different input levels. So this guesstimate, this heuristic, this um, is is bad, um, and what you're also going to see is if you plot the test data, and I haven't done that here, but later on you'll plot the test data and you'll see that the um, test data points vary a lot more than you see here in the training data points. So, and and that's something that will happen a lot later on. You will given a limited training data set, you have to train a model, uh, and you might um, you might have some uh, heuristic rule with which you compute a point estimate for some important parameter, but it turns out that at deployment, when you when you're deploying the model to, to its operating setting, that uh, actually the operating setting is much more varied, or there's regimes, parameter regimes that you haven't come across yet. And basically, this uh, this number that you plug in here with your with your guesstimate, your heuristic is a bad representation of the actual underlying variance of the observed signal. And so what I'm basically showing with this assignment is that um, 
if you don't know something, don't try to um, estimate it, guesstimate it with a heuristic over a limited training data set. Um, take a Bayesian approach, consider it a random variable, put a prior on it, and you might, you know, in some settings, you might be much more certain about it, but you're never fully certain about the value of this parameter. But so th this level of certainty can just be designed through the design of the prior distributions. You can either make a concentrate around some value very closely, basically ignoring all other values, or you can make it very uncertain and say, I'm going to be, I'm going to assign relatively high probability to a range of values. But I mean, you should take a Bayesian approach to this, consider it on a variable, put a prior on it, and then simultaneously infer a posterior for it. Um, <clears throat> so that's a much more principled approach. And, um, but that does mean that you, uh, this regression model with both an unknown set of coefficients and an unknown precision, uh, you're not able to do exact Bayesian inference in this. So you need variational base, you need a recognition model, one recognition factor for each unknown, and you need to uh, use some method to minimize free energy, i.e. adjust these variational parameters such that the recognition factors uh, capture the unknown posterior well, the unknown posteriors well. Uh, and that's essentially what we're doing in uh, question five. Um, all right. Uh, does that answer your question, Stefan? Okay, I'm gonna, yeah, okay, yes, clear, okay. Um, okay, so then I've had Stefan, G, um, B1. Um, Khan, you, you sent a link to one of the, yeah. Just for the uh, site, the other problem, uh, someone yeah. asked. Right, yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so this is what we talked about, yeah. So I, I, uh, I think I, Answer that this morning, the Formula A1, yeah. Okay, so this is again about the uh, local variational parameter xi i. You can define a precision parameter for each data point, but um, I strongly encourage you not to. Um, I mean, th there is something to say, to say for uh, defining a precision parameter per unique input level, per frequency um, level. You can do that. Um, but if you define a precision parameter for each data point, you essentially also, you, you would have a different unknown random variable for every data point. And that also means you only have one sample, one observation to compute a posterior distribution for that precision parameter. And I think that's where uh, often things go wrong because um, these all of these posteriors that you get, these n posteriors that you get, uh, for the precision parameters, they're going to be sort of poor estimates, and um, you, you, yeah, you, you won't get a nicely fitting distribution. It's it's fine in this model for now to just assume there is a, a shared tau, a shared precision variable over all of the observations, and uh, basically use all of the observations to compute a single posterior for tau. That's going to give you the best um, fit for the for the regression line. Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, so if you, indeed, if you get, if you'll get a lot of these posteriors for each psi i, for each uh, precision parameter, and you can compute all of the modes, so you can plot all of those, but um, I would just try to uh, compute a single posterior for, 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 for psi, if you've named it psi, and then uh, compute the mode for that. Um, yeah, so Paula, um, is it is this clear? I'm just gonna quickly answer what I what I uh, told you um, ten minutes ago. Uh, again, the local variational parameter is from uh, from the classification setting is not the same as just the general variational parameter for recognition factor. Local variational parameter refers to a very specific thing in uh, Bishop, a very specific uh, approximation method that Bishop uses for a logit node. You don't need the same 
uh, local variation parameter anywhere else. Uh, and I, I think you also had a few is, uh, situations where uh, if you go back to the uh, classification setting, um, we also define this local variational parameter as something really odd. It's this um, probability distribution function with a mode at 1.0. This is not going to work in regression in the assignment for, for a regression model because this is a degenerate, a pathological probability distribution. It basically only works if you use psi i for a logit node. Um, yeah, I'll, um, so you need one local variational parameter uh, when you. Uh, All right. Um, any other questions? Let's see. Did I go through all of my notes? Yeah. I um, in one of the questions. Oh yeah, yeah. So some of the questions are. Um, um, Yeah, mm, there have been so many questions and I'm, I'm not losing track, but um, uh, some of you have asked, um, like, why do I need this? Uh, I mean, I, I'm trying to extract the mean and covariance from my posterior. And uh, it's not working. It's saying that the distribution is improper. Um, that has a lot to do with uh, rounding error. So um, under the hood, um, Unilab uses, uh, let me just find it in some of the, the lectures. So if we go to continuous data and the Gaussian distribution, there is uh, this notion of the natural parameterization. Yeah. Um, so under the hood, Fornilab uses the natural or the canonical parameterization for Gaussian distributions. So that means it has a parameter, which is the precision weighted mean. Uh, and it has the, the precision matrix. Those are its two parameters with which it specifies a Gaussian distribution. So when you call mean on such a distribution, it is going to take this precision matrix and it's going to multiply, it's going to try to invert that. It's going to multiply that with the precision weighted mean in order to get the mean out. But in if during your estimation, so for a certain range of uh, prior parameters, the uh, precision parameter that you get during estimation will have entries that are going to be subject to rounding error. And if they are rounded in the wrong direction, then suddenly this precision matrix might no longer be positive definite. And when you try to invert this positive definite matrix, it's it's going to it's going to say, well, I can't invert this precision parameter. And then the error that Fornilab uh, provides is saying, well, I mean. I can't work with this distribution because it has improper parameters. That's a very sort of general error, but it should be read as I cannot invert this precision matrix. Uh, so one way to deal with this, or one way to get around this, is to use fornilab.unsafe mean. Uh, you've seen it a couple of times before now. Um, uh, let me try and find one. Um, Yeah, you've seen it here, unsafe me, and um, you can similarly specify unsafe Kolf. And what unsafe does, it um, tries to retrieve these parameters directly, and will, will, it's a bit more robust against numerical stability. So it basically checks, has there been, uh, do we suspect rounding error? Um, and if, if we do suspect rounding error, there'll be a slight 
regularization. So you add a diagonal matrix with machine precision elements, so one E minus eight, and then when you try to invert the matrix, it will succeed and it will give you an answer. Um, so if you are stuck with uh, situations where um, Fornet will tell you that um, I can't uh, deal with the, uh, if you, uh, so if you try mean posterior. Yeah, if this tells you that um, you're going to get a, uh, an improper distribution, just try uh, Fournier the unsafe mean. And this should be a robust to numerical precision. And so you have unsafe mean, you have unsafe curve, and that should be all you need. Any question? Yeah, come. you have a question on that? Uh, how can I get extract uh, shape parameters after the iterations? Right, that's uh, going to be, um, so if you use tau. Yep. Oh, sorry. Um, no, sorry. Um, so A and B. If tau is common distributed, it will have two parameters, A and B, and you can extract them usually through params. And the reason why this doesn't work with uh, like M and V for a Gaussian mean variance is because Fourier is under the hood using this canonical parameterization. So the underlying distribution does not have an M and a V, it has a, a chi and a, and a W, which, which does work, but then you still need to manually um, invert W and multiply the inverse with chi to get the mean. Um, that's why we use mean and cold on it. Yep, thank you. Look. Um, let's see, I still have one note. Uh, yeah, so we figured out that, um, um, so the Gaussian mean variance uh, node um, actually does not have a, a message towards its variance parameter. Uh, it used to have one, and it's gone now, and I think something might have gone wrong in development. Um, so if you are using Gaussian mean variance as the likelihood, uh, switch to Gaussian mean precision, because the Gaussian mean variance node will just tell you it does not have a variational update rule for its variational for its variance parameter. Um, that's just the current bargain point. If we if you move to Gaussian mean precision, it will have a, an update rule for the precision parameter. Uh, Max, you have a question? Um, yeah, I was, I did question two uh, of the, yeah, of the assignment, and I, yes. I, I got an, uh, a variance which is quite low. Uh, so, mm. so uh, in Bert's, in Bert's lecture, we, uh, uh, yeah, he on regression, I think he, he explained. Um, a way to yeah, calculate it, yeah. Uh, but it seems uh, that the uh, second part of the term, so the uh, uh, not the, be the the beta, but the other part, is in the milli uh, yeah values. Milli yeah, milli okay. range. So it's quite low, and I, I I don't find that logical. Looking at the data we got, yeah. Um so one thing to keep in mind is that um, um, yeah, so um, try to, so I mean, I haven't seen your model specification, but I've, uh, I've noticed uh, there have been a few questions where uh, someone, for instance, has used variance instead of precision for the prior. And so you might get, so this number should be quite, large, so it's S of N. Um, well, I mean, it shouldn't be quite large, but I mean, it should not be in the middle. So X here, you can see that X is um, uh, on the order of, um, so 100 and, uh, see if it are normal ones. So you can see those X's are quite large. They are 100 and, and uh, what is it, 110 up to 130. 
So we're basically, this will be some value 120, and this will also be 120. So we have some number, and we're multiplying that with 120 squared. So that's a huge number. So if you're getting um, a milli, if, if this thing in total is something that's uh, three points behind the decimal, then this thing, this S of N, will be insanely small because it's it's being multiplied with 120 squared. Um, uh, I don't think that's supposed to be the case. Um, you might have some inversion problem there. Um, I have the same problem, and I feel like maybe the issue is in um, in where you calculate in uh, in uh, exercise one the the precision because I looked at it. Uh, like a couple of times because I really couldn't find how this could go wrong, but the variance of the precision that I get there is already, um, yeah, it's around five, and then the the this that translates to a variance that's all, also already super low. Yeah, but you have to uh, keep in mind that um, in the assignment we have tau, and tau corresponds to beta. Yeah. So beta is fine. It could be five. Um, but beta will not affect this S of M. No, so but that's if, also really low in other exercises. If I run the, I think it was um, BP4, and then the, I don't know, the exercise or something, I looked at it, and there they had a beta value one, and that's what caused the variance quite low, because the SN there of that part was also really low. Mm. Um, right, give me a sec. Um, Oh. <laughs> um, this is the uh, posterior. No, no, no. This isn't. Hold on. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think it's supposed to be um, quite small, actually. At least that's what I'm also getting. So don't worry about it then. If it's something like this, then uh, don't worry about it. Okay, yeah, it's something like that. Yeah. Um, uh, mine is bigger, by the way. Much, much more okay. bigger. Yeah, I um, like that. Well, I mean, it also depends on the, the tau that you've computed. So um, you can either compute the variance for each, um, for each uh, input level, then invert it, and then take the average. Or you can do it the other way around. You can first average it and then invert it. And both will give you a different number for tau. And that might be what's causing the uh, magnitude shift. This is what it's supposed to look like in uh, question five. So the if, if you take um, tau to be an unknown random variable, and we're going to do an estimate of that, you can see that even so your, your training data set is quite limited. We only have 50 samples. so. We're still quite uncertain about this tau parameter, and here you can see it has quite a big uh, effect on the resulting posterior predictive. It's quite, it's a lot larger here. I should, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, I'm plotting variance here. Yeah. Okay. Um, close, yeah. Um, Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, Cecile asks, is recursive estimation better than the batch estimation? When to use which one? Um, so in regression, um, after you've observed all of the data, your 
recursive estimate should be the same as the batch estimate. Um, however, um, the recursive estimate, because you have to do this bookkeeping of parameters as you go through the data, I've seen quite a lot of people sort of slightly get it wrong. Um, and, and that's sometimes leading to odd results. If I were you, I would pick the batch estimation case. We only have 50 data samples, so that's not a lot. You don't have to wait a long time before you're, I mean, the ma often the, the main reason for choosing a recursive or batch is that if you have the time, you would run a batch estimate, an offline estimate. If you're doing data analysis, you've collected data and you put it on a computer, you want to do some analysis, just that, turn the computer on, let it run, walk away. Um, but if you if you have some sort of embedded electronics, like something that has to process information on the fly, then it doesn't have enough power to buffer uh, tons of observations and do a batch estimate. Like it needs to recursively update its parameters, and that's also that's when you would use recursive estimation. So computing resources often determine whether you use recursive or batch. In this case, I would um, I would go for batch because batch is a bit more robust. In we just define priors once, one set of prior parameters. We absorb all of the data at once, run a posterior. It will only take you, uh, I think, 20 seconds or something, to infer the, uh, to infer those posteriors, and then um, you don't have to deal with <coughs> bookkeeping of these parameters over time. Um, so for Q1, should we use Gaussian mean precision instead of Gaussian mean variance because of the update rule issue, or is it only matters for the other exercises? It only matters for the, the second exercise, because if you fix the precision parameter, some value, it doesn't need to send the backwards message to that parameter. It, it basically, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't need to do that. So it doesn't, it doesn't look for a, an update rule for the variance or precision parameter. All right, I've gone through all of my notes. Um, I see that there were still some uh, there were still some open issues on Piazza, and there were some new ones as well. So I will do my best to um, get through them as much as possible, as fast as possible. Um, um, as for so Monday, it's a deadline. Um, let me just check exactly what time the deadline is. Uh, It's uh, nine in the morning. Uh, so Monday morning at nine is the deadline for the assignment. Um, uh, Heng Jian asks, oh, you've, you've posted a, an error, a key error. Yes, yeah, so you've not defined posterior xi. You, I mean, you're defining that just above the step uh, function, but that's too late. You need to define it when you initialize the posterior distributions. Have a look at the uh, regression um, uh, or, or just any of the models in PP3 and PP4. You can see we define the posterior distributions and then we, we start this for loop for, uh, for step functions. Uh, because this, this is not going to work the way it is. Um, so Monday morning, nine o'clock, uh, it's the uh, assignment deadline. Um, again, I'll do my best to get through all of the Piazza questions uh, as fast as possible. Um, we don't have any, so Friday is the last session, then Magnus is going to talk about what is life, and I mean, that's a very interesting session. And I'm not going to hijack that one with um, sort of solutions. For, I mean, it's also too early to provide solutions for the assignment. So we, we don't have a session after the deadline. Um, so I'm going to post the solution notebook. You've already seen a glimpse of it. I'm just going to post the solution notebook uh, to the website. And you can have a look for yourself. And if you still have some questions on why uh, something works or why something is done the way it is, post them to Piazza. Uh, we can respond there. And um, uh, that will probably also help in uh, learning for the exam. If, if there's still something con confusing you about the uh, solution, then um, yeah, we'll help you in that way. All right. Um, yeah, Heng Jian, I'm not going to do. Yeah, now you've done key Kai sub one. But you're. I mean, have you the. 
Yeah, so post it in Piazza. I'll get to it. I'm not going to do it here over chat because there's other people right? and we're, we're reaching our two hour deadline. Yeah, so if you put it outside, then you, at some point you're asking for Kai sub one and you have not initialized that anywhere in your posterior dictionary. So and somewhere in your model specification, you've defined Xi1. Again, I would not do that. I would just take a single shared precision parameter Chi. So don't ask for Xi1. And uh, if, you, if you do want Xi1, you should also, in your initial posterior distribution, uh, posterior initialization, you should define a Xi1 is something. Um, just, I'll, I'll, um, I'll answer your questions on uh, Piazza. Okay, um, any remaining questions, send them to Piazza. Um, best of luck with the remainder of the assignments. I hope the probabilistic programming sessions were fun and, and uh, enjoyable and uh, educational. I think, I hope it helped in making some of the math a bit less abstract and, and uh, more, um, you can get more hands-on experience of what does it mean to, to have these uh, prior parameters? What if I change certain things? How will this affect the results? Um, I hope these notebooks have been easy to work with. I mean, there have been some software installation issues. Normally we would fix that by on campus, so we just walk over, I see you have some issues, and we fix it right away. And now we, um, we're in this online setting where things are a bit more difficult. But we, I mean, the reason we chose Jupyter Notebooks is because you have this thing in front of you that has uh, math equations, it has explanations, it has links, so you can just open uh, various, you can point to various other things. And it has code, and when you run the code, it makes visualizations. It's just a one-stop uh, set of lecture notes, that an interactive set of lecture notes. And uh, uh, Angian, I'll just post it in uh, Piazza. I'm not going to go more into this now. Um, uh, yeah. So um, I hope the uh, probabilistic programming sessions were uh, fun, um, exciting, and um, Best of luck uh, with the remainder of the assignment, and best of luck studying for the exam. And um, we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you around after the, the course. I'm uh, signing off.